Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. I don't know how I got myself into this, but here I am doing another debunking video uh, in response to Danny at GR Research. Uh, today he posted a video where he took a couple of inductors, crossover inductors, and put them next to each other and fed power to one, and uh, lo and behold, the other one picked up that uh, sound and played it in a Twitter. And uh, he then claimed, therefore, same things happening to two speaker wires if they're next to each other, and therefore this is a bad thing. Uh, puzzling that uh, he didn't use two speaker wires. <laughs> you know, he has speaker wires, he has his own fancy speaker wire. Why would you t do the test with coils and not speaker wire? Uh, there's a huge difference between a speaker wire and a coil. Uh, a coil, as you see, the wires are wound in many, many turns and speaker wire normally doesn't have any many turns in it and uh, as i'll show later on it makes a difference so what he didn't do um we're gonna do we're gonna test speaker wire rather than uh, trying to play with inductors although i'll i'll show you how you can make your own inductor out of that so why don't we uh switch away from uh, his browser and go to my audio precision so i have a simple setup where my audio precision, all it has is the uh, crunchy old uh, nasty zip cord uh, uh, speaker wire and uh, I'm just using my LED lamp as a holder for it and uh, goes from input to output, I'm feeding a 4 volts which at 8 ohms would be equivalent to 2 watts so not a lot of power I've set that to be the zero level over here as I explained in my DB video and if we look in here we'll see that uh, we got a tiny bit of uh, mains hum here uh, at almost minus 150 dB. So extremely small amount of interference being picked up. And remember threshold of hearing uh, for our most sensitive region is at minus 115. So this is at minus 150. So definitely not a concern. So now look at what happens when I grab this wire. And I bring in a mains cable, a hefty one that I use for uh, uh, amplifier testing. And it's actually plugged in at the other end, so it's just, this is live. Uh, don't lick that end. Not good for you. Um, and I hold this next to this, and we see that, yeah, lo and behold, it does pick up some interference. We're now up to 130 dB. I've got them pretty parallel with each other. and But minus 130 still massively below threshold of hearing. Indeed, you can go do this test yourself, put the wire next to it, and then stick your ear next to the speaker, see if you can hear any hum and buzz. I guarantee you, you will not hear hum and buzz. But uh, notice what happens if we uh, loop these things together. Hopefully the effect will be there. Uh, nah, I can't get it to really peak any more than uh, it already does. Uh, there we go. Uh, so maybe, maybe a few more dB if we make an inductor out of it. So even though I'm doing something you're not supposed to do, which is make an inductor and take your speaker wire and a mains wire and tightly couple them, make multiple loops, you still don't get there. And look at how sensitive it is to even just location and, and movement of this thing. There's no way I can induce any kind of meaningful uh, noise there. Now, threshold of hearing, uh, as I mentioned, is minus 115 dB, but that minus 115 dB is at 2 to 3 kilohertz. It is not at 60 hertz. 60 hertz, our threshold of hearing is probably minus uh, about plus 70 dB SPL. So this uh, hump needs to be way up here, many, many dBs uh, higher. Uh, sorry, you couldn't see my cursor before. Um, you need it to be a lot higher for it to be uh, audible, and it's not remotely, remotely so. But there's a more important point in here. We can measure this. So when you say, hey, there's electromagnetic interference, I just measured it. I just showed it to you. You saw that it took no work. Turn on the analyzer, plug in a cable, boom. We're measuring the effect of interference. So there is no mystery in here as far as what we can measure, yet... Danny says that the improvement these cables provide in eliminating or reducing electromagnetic interference are not measurable. Well, we're measuring it. 
he indeed measured it himself. He was showing the effect going up and down as he put the two coils next to each other. So clearly parts of his arguments don't hold at all. It's this uh, classic issue I see in these, all these high-end tweaks and high-end ideas in that they hypothesize a problem before proving that the problem exists, they go and, and think of a solution to it. They neither verify that the hypothesis is correct, nor verify that the solution is correct. Obviously, if you don't understand the problem, you haven't measured it, you haven't quantified it, how do you know you're solving it? It can't be just by osmosis. You just sort of have such vision that you can imagine a problem and without verifying the problem exists, say, hey, you know, it's there. Now, he says, well, the problem's audible. Well, great, do a controlled blind listening test. Take a mains cable, put it next to the uh, other cable, put another speaker wire next to another one without the person seeing it and see if they can tell the difference. See if they can raise their hand when you put them next to each other without seeing and take it away, see if they put their hands down. So listening tests are perfect. Love listening tests. Hey, throw away all this stuff. Show me listening tests. But when you show, you know, fixtures and supposed measurements, well, tit for tat, uh, I can measure it and my test is more valid than his because I'm using speaker wire. And I'm showing you the exact difference, even if it's inaudible, I'm able to show it to you. This instrument can measure things that are hugely below threshold of hearing. So it isn't that we can't measure, our measurements are too good. We measure things that, that are absolutely inaudible, but the effect is there. If I breathe on this cable, I just look at it, just move it around. Notice that I can just, the graph changes. So this is how sensitive it is. You think you can tell that your stereo sounds different if you just move the speaker wire a little bit like this? Can you hear that difference? You cannot, right? Yet instrumentation has no trouble quantifying exactly what's happening to our signal. And this is relative to two watts. If I make this 100 watts, these levels will shrink even more. Yet the instrumentation is happy. That's what we have instrumentation. We, we can find things that, you know, with a microscope, we can see things that we can't see with the naked eye. That's what this is. There's nothing weird about it to say, oh, doesn't mean anything. I don't look at graphs. Well, no, this graph picks up things where we can verify a theory. Indeed, we have a problem. We have interference magnetically on RF, as I showed in my last video. The problem for these folks is that we can easily then apply psychoacoustics to this and say it's not audible. You can talk about it all you want. Wave your hands. Put two coils next to each other have nothing to do with a speaker wire. But it's not logic. It's not science. It's not consistent in itself. You know, as I said in my last video, if it's only audible, fine. Don't show these tests then, where you take two coils of them next to each other and say, hey, just imagine if these are speaker wires. Why do I need to imagine? You have speaker wires, put them next to each other. <laughs> What's so hard about that? Well, what was hard is that if you put the speaker wires next to each other, it wouldn't pick up anything. You have to make them two inductors so they have a strong magnetic coupling. Anyway, I don't know that if you want to stare at me anymore talking about these uh, uh, topics, so I'll go ahead and stop this uh, before it runs too long. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.